We just read the passage previous to this, or leading up to this, in our responsive reading, where Mary was told, the announcing angel informed her of the great news, shocking news to her, but the great news, the good news of great joy. And then she went to see Elizabeth. And we pick up, as we look today at what I'm calling the gospel according to Mary, we'll look at verses 46 to 55, Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. I hope you found that in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'll have the text on the screen for you so that you can see as well as hear the scripture. And stand with me, if you would, as, as we look at this passage. This is Mary's response to Elizabeth's Holy Spirit-filled proclamation. It's called the Magnificat. And the reason it is is because if you read uh, the Latin Vulgate, the Latin version of the Bible, the first word in that in this verse is magnificat. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. So we read it today, and we hear the, the heart expression and response of Mary to what was, a, what was really for her a validation of what the angel had told her. Let us appreciate one of the first people to speak the gospel, the good news, of the Savior who was about to be born. Thank you. Please be seated. I read an article some time ago by a man named Scott McKnight entitled, The Mary We Never Knew. He really challenged my thinking about certain aspects of her. He asserts in his article that there are two Marys. There is the he, this is a description. One who wears Carolina blue robe, exudes piety from a somber face, often holds her baby son in her arms, and barely makes eye contact with us. This is the familiar Blessed Virgin Mary. And she leads us to a Christmas celebration of quiet reflection. And he said this, But there's another Mary, the Blessed Valorous Mary, or Valiant Wears ordinary clothing, exudes hope from a confident face. This Mary utters poetry fit for a political rally, goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Herod the Great, musters her motherliness to reprimand her Messiah's son for dallying at the temple, follows her faith to ask him to address uh, a flagging wine supply at a wedding, and then finds the feistiness to take her children to Capernaum to rescue Jesus from death threats. This Mary, he says, followed Jesus all the way to the cross, not just as a mother, but as a disciple, even after his closest followers deserted him. She leads us to Christmas, to a Christmas marked by a yearning for justice and the courage to fight for it. I want to think for just a few minutes this morning about how Mary, the, the role that she played, and how we can appreciate her and we can commend her. Oh. Perhaps if I can use the term in the best sense of the term, <clears throat> the original feminist as ordered by God, not what's going on today. She was 14 years old, probably. Joseph, maybe 18. When you read the birth narratives, 
we've got to be astounded and shocked in several different ways that, that they made the journey to Bethlehem. Yes, the Bible tells us that when Joseph heard that his fiance, his betrothed, was with child, that he pondered, should I, should I put her away? But the angel convinced him that what was happening was of God, and he stood by her. So they make this journey to Bethlehem, a difficult journey, under any circumstances. But for a woman, a young woman, a teenage woman, soon to give birth to her first child, it was a very challenging, arduous journey. And there he is by her side, unflinching, willing to have heaped upon him the invectives of the culture. Either Joseph should be ashamed of himself or whose baby is this if it's not Joseph's baby? And there they go to Bethlehem. There's a lot of questions you could ask, but I think that what we need to observe this morning is that there are certain corners of Christendom that make too much of Mary. They, they use terms of her like co-redemptrix, which means that she has some sort of redeeming work that she does. Co-mediatrix, uh, she is a mediator. You can pray to her just like you pray to Jesus. We reject all those things. But we dare not make too little of her. She's God's chosen vessel. And we need to, I think, rediscover the powerful commitment and faithful commitment of a 14-year-old girl who said when the angel told her she was going to give birth to the Son of God, she said, may it be done to me as you have said. And she embraced it, though it shattered her world, shattered her plans. So that's the kind of gospel that is offered to us, that we offer to others. It's not a gospel that fits comfortably within your schedule or my schedule. I have no doubt on this morning that people have been challenged. Professing Christians have been challenged. Do we open gifts? Do we attend service? How do we fit it all in? The gospel comes and says, your agenda is shattered. It's no longer about you. It's about the Lord. And that's what we see in Mary. May it be done to me as you have said. So I want to suggest to you this morning as we look at the, at the Magnificat, her response, would you have written this? Would you have predicted this? Elizabeth says, how have I been so privileged that the mother of my Lord should visit me? My little preborn, who's who's six, seven months in the womb, leaped with joy inside my womb when he heard your voice, because you're carrying the Holy One. Mary's response: My soul magnifies the Lord. I'm carrying the life inside of me. And while she could spend time worrying and wondering and, and dealing with all that comes with uh, pregnancy for a lady, she rather focuses upon the Lord. What an example she is. You could say that this was a trying time for her. A pregnancy without a husband in a culture where women were often stoned to death for that. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She's just been told that she is carrying the Messiah, the long-awaited one. And she 
expresses her love for God, her trust and confidence in God, that God is my Savior. He hasn't doomed me. He hasn't abandoned me. He hasn't played a cruel cosmic trick on me. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Elizabeth has said, you are blessed and people will call you blessed. And so Mary picks that up. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. In fact, I'll remind you that when Jesus was struggling of that Via Dolorosa, that, that, that way of suffering on the way to the cross, bearing part of his cross, he was falling under the load and women approached him and said, Blessed is the woman who nursed you. What were they doing? They're doing exactly what Mary said would happen. Highly favored is the woman who was chosen by God to bring you into this world. She says, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. I just can't emphasize too much. I want you to notice her response to unexpected news. Now, she was a good Jewess. She awaited and longed for and anticipated the coming of Messiah to set the people of God free. But this was a little up close and personal for her. She's going to be that vessel. She's going to be that vehicle. Once she gives birth, remember, they have to flee to Egypt because Herod wants to execute all babies two years and younger to make sure that he, all babies, to wipe them out that they not be allowed to survive a baby boy who could, as the, as the wise men had told him, who could rise to be the king. Mary is the mother of this child. It would have implications for her as well. As Jesus grows up, Mary will always be identified with him um, many times, most of the time, for ill. You may remember when Jesus was, uh, was teaching at one point, they said in the Gospels, isn't this Mary's son? In that culture, you did not call a child, particularly a male child, identified to his mother. You identified him to his father. Isn't this Mary's son? Casting aspersion, even when he was a full-grown man, upon the circumstances surrounding his conception. Mary bore that her entire life. She says he has done great things for me. And holy is his name. She did not see that, that she had been uh, tricked, misused, abused, led astray, taken advantage of. None of those things occurred to her. She calls upon God as her Savior, as mighty, and as holy. She is, she is an example to us of how we need to embrace providences that come to us from God, even difficult providences, even providences that we never could have anticipated, imagined, or dreamed of. Holy is his name. And then she declares some of the attributes of God. He has mercy. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Notice what she's saying here. She recognizes God as a God of mercy and attaches to that this, this fear of awe, this but you don't, you don't question God. You don't challenge his goodness. You, you stand in awe of him. And know that if you're one who, who reveres him, who can say of him with sincerity, he is holy. He is mighty. He saves. That you're a recipient of his mercy, of his, of his love of kindness, his love of pity on those who have ill fortune on those who don't have much of this world's goods. And she, she, is a, she has a long look at things. Notice for Mary, it's not about me. He has mercy for those who fear him from generation to generation. She, she is looking at the long look. She is, in, in many ways, walking out what the Proverbs in Proverbs 31 described 
is the virtuous woman. She, she looks at the future. She smiles at it. She laughs at it. Mary knows that not only is she a recipient of God's mercy, but she is one who can communicate that in such a way to see it effectively and effectually passed on to generation after generation. Notice the next verse. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. One writer that was reading about this said, when she is saying that, she was thinking about the, the Jewish ruler, Herod, the Roman rulers, the Roman occupation. And she has every confidence that in some way the child she is carrying will bring down the mighty, that he will rise and kingdoms will fall before him. I don't pretend for a moment she can work all that out, but you know there's a, there's a popular song that's sung around Christmas time, Mary, did you know? And it asks some things that, that perhaps specifically she would not have known, but, but by and large, you know, Mary knew, Mary understood. Mary had been taught by the angels and ministered to by the Holy Spirit and convinced of this she is bearing the one who, as she was told by Simeon when they would carry Jesus into the temple on the eighth day to have him circumcised, this child will be for the rising and falling of many. She believed that. She has a confidence in God's mercy and in God's might. And he did not, she did not think that he had dealt deal with her, that his dealings with her were a manifestation of the strength of his arm. That's how she received it. This is a mighty work of God. And that she had every expectation that the proud would be scattered, that the mighty would be brought down from thrones. And he's exalted those of humble estate. And she was, she was feeling that. She was experiencing that. But she said that here's someone, probably one of the least likely. If you had made a list if you had made a list among those inhabitants of women who would be the mothers of the coming Messiah, Mary would not have made the list. Not an inexperienced 14-year-old girl. No. Probably a mother of several who had proven herself to be a capable woman. A mother capable of raising children effectively. No. He's exalted those of humble estate. She testifies to the goodness of the Lord, very much like the psalmist did. And the psalmist said, I've seen a lot of things in my life. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen the Lord's seed begging bread. She talks about how he has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he sent away empty. Mary has an, an understanding in the early stages of her pregnancy that God is going to do something that's going to turn the world as they know it upside down. The hunger will be filled. The rich will be empty. And we remember we will see that in Jesus' ministry when there was a beggar who was laid at the gates of a rich man. The rich man, we're told, fared sumptuous. No, he ate whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it. But walk past the beggar. In the course of time, they come to die. And you see the long term, the meaningful, the important implications of their lives. The beggar is carried to the bosom of Abraham. A symbolism for, for being with God. The rich man is cast into the abode of the damned, of tor torment. Mary is anticipating that sort of thing. When she talks about, he fills the hungry with good things. The rich, he sends away empty. And you remember that story Jesus tells, that the rich man cries out, Oh, Father Abraham, send, send the beggar, send Lazarus to dip his, his finger in the water and come touch my tongue. I'm tormented in these flames. No. Won't happen, there's a gulf fixed. Well, Father Abraham, then send Lazarus back to my brothers. No. No. Mary is 
seeing God that way. She had insight uh, that very few people did as she was given the task by God to bear and raise his darling son. She recognizes what God is doing can be spoken of in terms of he has helped his servant Israel. That's, a, that's not only a, a historical reality. But you look back on the story of Israel and you see this, this ebb and flow. If you're familiar with it, and we'll see some of that when we, when we do an overview of the, of the scriptures in the evening times in the, in the coming weeks. How God shows Israel favor. Israel takes the favor of God. Delights in it. And then begins to presume upon it. Enjoy God's good things, but turn their backs on God himself. And God punishes Israel. And they despair. And they cry out. And he brings them back. He shows them mercy and goodness. And they delight in God. And the cycle goes on and on and on. She recognizes in that cycle, though you could chart those times of Israel's unfaithfulness, that God is the one who helps. He, he is, as the hymn we sing, he is our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. This is how Mary sees him, because it's not only historical, it's prophetic. She believes that what God has shown to her and what he is doing in her is something that will be the help of Israel, that they will be a people helped. And she says he's done this in remembrance of his mercy twice now in the Magnificat. She identifies the mercy of God. Now, theologians will differ over this, so I don't want to split hairs on this, but some have observed that when we're talking about God's love and God's mercy and God's grace, the love of God is, is this, this unconditional uh, kindness that he shows just out of the nature of his heart, to people who don't deserve it. That's agape love. That grace is more of this, this undeserved richness, this, this action of God. But mercy, they say, is a love that moves the heart of God to act, showing his grace. As I said, some theologians will, will go back and forth on that, but I do think there are two different words in, in the Greek language. You can make this distinction. And so she, has, she is emphasizing in the Magnificat that God, what God is doing in her and told her he's going to do through her, and going to do with the son she's carrying, is, is his moving in mercy. It's his love of pity, as some have described it. He has, he has looked upon sinners and he pities them. And the evidence of his pity is that he is sending his one and only son to live in the place of sinners, to live perfectly, to die in the place of sinners, to die as a substitution, taking upon himself both our sin and God's wrath. So that in that cross event that we've been studying in the Gospel of Mark recently, in that cross event, he satisfies divine justice. Mary is anticipating this as she looks to what God is doing. Notice, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. What is she doing there? She is citing God's covenant commitment. When, you, when they talk about speaking to Abraham and to the fathers, they're talking about the covenant manifestations of God. And she is aware that what she is now doing, uh, she is the, she's the God-bearer. She is carrying in her womb the Son of God. It's a fulfillment of the covenant that was made when God promised Adam and Eve that Eve would give birth, that her offspring would crush the head of the serpent, that, that little 
know, what we've told you before, sort of a shadowy expression of the covenant of grace. What was promised to Noah? There'd be a bow in the clouds, a rainbow. God's way of promising that he would never again destroy the earth this way, but that his promises would be fulfilled. The covenant to Abraham, who she mentions, that God would bless Abraham and give to him an offspring that was numberless. He said, count the stars if you can. Count the sands of the sea if you can. So shall your offspring be. And God pledged that in covenant pledge to Abraham. It was renewed in Isaac and again to Jacob. And then you have the Mosaic covenant where God gives his law on tablets of stone, those, those guardrails to lead his people, a people from whom he will bring Messiah. And then the covenant of David, which had particular interest to Mary, because she'd been told by the angels that the one she's carrying be his father David. It's not incidental or coincidental that she ends up in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, literally meaning the house of bread. But it's David's city. She's going to give birth to the son of David. David ruled, was deposed from his throne for a little while, regained his throne, and went on to glory. His sons ruled, passed it on, some good, some bad. But there's one coming, the son of David. When he comes to rule and sit on the throne, there will be no end to his reign. There will be no end to his dominion. He will rule and reign forever and ever. And she is, she is contemplating that when she says, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, to his offspring, forever. Because you see, after the Davidic covenant, what comes into play in the prophets is the new covenant. All of it, from Adam and Eve, all the way through that beginning of the covenant of grace has been pointing to the new covenant. What the Hebrew writer calls the everlasting covenant. The covenant of redemption. The covenant of shed blood. Mary is contemplating that. Have you thought about what would we know? What would we know about these events if it had not been for Mary's faithful witness. Joseph apparently died early on. There's no mention of him by the time Jesus reaches adulthood. Joseph is not around for Luke to interview. But he interviews Mary. What would we know? How much, how much poorer would we be if Mary had not been faithful? Not only to, to receive God's gift to have a child in her womb that she would bear and be the Messiah, but to faithfully tell about that. One writer suggested that he didn't think that, that the Magnificat was only sung one time by Mary. He said, I think she probably sang it over and over to tell forth God's goodness. It's from Mary that we know about the angelic visits with her and with Joseph. It's from Mary that we know about the, the journey to Bethlehem. It's from Mary that we know about the uh, shepherds who have the angels appear to them as they watch their flocks by night. It's from Mary that we know about the journey to Egypt. It's from Mary that we know about the, the journey of the Magi who come later on uh, when Jesus is a toddler and bring their gifts. It's from Mary that we know about the journey to the temple, Jesus' first trip to the temple. Think how poor our history of Jesus Christ would be was it not for the faithfulness of Mary. She is one who for us receives the gospel and all of its implications. For her, the gospel, the good news, turned her world upside down. It would never be the same never be the same. She receives it. She declares it. And she 
fleshes it out. Because if you remember the gospel accounts, over time, Mary approaches Jesus in his ministry a couple of times, and he'll say things to her like, Lord, what, my hour has not yet come. Why would you ask me this? Yet she follows him faithfully to the end. As we said last week, the week before, Mary was among the women at the cross. The most big, bold, brave fishermen when the zealots fled and abandoned him. Mary was there. How do we know? Because Jesus said from the cross to the Apostle John, Behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. As he makes that transfer to be sure that Mary will be cared for after he's gone. She's at the tomb. Mary becomes not only the God-bearer, not only the, the tender young lady who gives birth to Messiah, who nurtures him, who raises him, who ponders all these amazing things as she interprets them. That's the meaning of the word ponder. It's to interpret, to interpret, understand them. And raises him and follows him all the way to the end. We celebrate today, not because it happened today, but a day set aside to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And as we exalt his name and rejoice that we have in him a savior we need to remember one of the first people who told forth the gospel yes the shepherds made their declaration but one of the first human beings in the new covenant era to declare the gospel and it was none other than Mary what a wonderful example she is for our daughters, for young women, for our granddaughters, for women of any age, of faithfulness, of willingness to embrace the will of God. What if this year, 2017, we could live this year saying, my motto for 2017 will be, may it be done unto me as the Lord has said. How does that change? That changes a lot of things, I believe. And I want you today, as we wrap up here in a few minutes, and as you think about the birth of Jesus, celebrate his birth in many different ways, I want you to remember and thank God for Mary. I happen to think that because some have abused her role and exalted her to something almost of, of, of the divine that we have unwittingly backed away and, and overreacted and sort of pushed that back. I don't think that's right. I think we need to give her her due. We need to thank God for her. I say, dear Lord, as I live out my days, may I be faithful as Mary was faithful only to receive your will, only to do your will, but to do this all the way to the end. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you today in Jesus' name, and we do thank you for this life. Uh, and we confess that, that we do tend to see the postcard image of her, and yet, when we move beyond that, this was one incredible young woman. But you knew that. You chose her to be the one who would carry our Lord, bear him, raise him, give him to you to accomplish your will. We're thankful that she followed all the way to the end. That's my desire for me. Lord, we know, we know people, we could name people who began but don't finish well. Who began but who falter, fall away. Lord, 
Help us to be faithful to follow all the way to the end and remember people like Mary, how she lived the gospel, declared the gospel, believed the gospel as an example for our daughters, our granddaughters, any woman who would identify as a woman of God, but really for all of us, male or female. And thank you that you gave Jesus to be our Savior. And that we can sing with joy because of your grace and your love for us, we have a Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stand with me as